Hello everyone, and welcome back to First Friday Fives at Go Big Bore or Go Home. I'm your host, Sean, and before we begin, I would like to take a moment to send my condolences to Bogue Quinn and the rest of the Quinn family, as well as all of their friends and associates over at GunBlast.com. If you hadn't heard, Jeff Quinn, the main writer and host of GunBlast, passed away just over a week ago on July 27, 2020. Jeff was a truly knowledgeable gun writer and, from all accounts, was the epitome of a gentleman. While I never met Jeff in person, I had emailed Jeff with questions from time to time. He always took the time to respond and answer my questions. I found him to be enjoyable to watch, and I took some cues from how he gripped big bore revolvers. Thanks to watching Jeff, my left index finger no longer gets bruised. To borrow one of his favorite words, I always had a dandy time reading his articles and watching his videos. I can say without hyperbole that the gun industry will be the lesser now that he is gone. Thank you, Jeff, and may your memory be forever with us all. For this month, I wanted to talk about more big bore cartridges that ran face first into a brick wall. Like before, we're looking at cartridges that sounded good on paper, but an execution came off like the Super Mario Brothers film from the 1990s. If you haven't seen it, don't. You'll want to claw your eyes out. Whether they failed to perform as promised or never caught on, here are five more big bore handgun cartridges that failed epically. Number 5. The 400 Corban. The 400 Corban was developed by Corban's founder Peter Pye back in 1997. Like the 40 Super, the idea was to have a 40 caliber semi-auto bottlenecked cartridge, but it was closer in design to the 40 Super's predecessor, the 10mm Centaur, than the 40 Super was. The cartridge was a 45 auto casing that was necked down to a 40 caliber with a brass case length of 0.898 inches or 22.8mm like the 45 auto. The cartridge had a maximum chamber pressure of 35,000 psi and was even SAMI certified to make it a legitimate non-wildcat cartridge. The basic concept was to be able to shoot a 10mm auto powered cartridge out of a 45 auto platform like the 1911 with little modification, and in fairness, it was able to do this for the most part. But as the saying goes, almost only counts with horseshoes and hand grenades. With bullet weights up to 165 grains, the 400 Corban was able to either slightly outpace or match the 10mm auto, but once your bullet weight got higher than that, the 400 Corban started to fall behind the Big 10. At least, that was true when you kept it to SAMI spec loadings. You could exceed them, but that resulted in some pistols going kaboom! Unlike the 40 Super that started with a 45 Winchester Magnum casing and beefed it up from there, the 400 Corban brass was based on the 45 Auto and was not as strong as the 40 Super brass. When I spoke to an aftermarket barrel company a couple years ago, they stated they no longer make 400 Corban barrels because hand loaders were loading the cartridge too hot and turning the barrels into scrap metal. Poor Peter Pie. His Wildcat ideas just never work out in the end. Some firearms manufacturers did offer 400 Corban models on a limited scale for a short time. But that didn't last long as the cartridge really was an in-between when compared to the 40 Smith & Wesson in the 10mm Auto. Not to mention some people were overloading it and creating a literal hand grenade. With disappointing performance and the lack of support from aftermarket barrel companies as well as firearms manufacturers, the 400 Corban soon became a cautionary tale of what happens when a cartridge doesn't live up to its promises. Number 4. The 44 Automag Pistol. Whenever you pen a design for a new product, you need to have a target consumer group and a marketing campaign that will sell the idea to those folks. Without those two things, you just end up with an also-ran. In the late 1960s, early 70s, a gun shop owner named Harry Sanford was talking to his gunsmith, Max Guerra, about the idea of a semi-automatic 44 Magnum. They were wondering, why hadn't it been made yet? So, Max Guerra started drawing up designs for the gun and, naturally, suggested a rimless version of the 44 Magnum would feed and eject in a semi-auto pistol significantly better. So they started by cutting down 308 Winchester and 30-06 brass to about 1.293 inches to create the new cartridge. In the new Automag pistol that was released in 1971, the cartridge would shoot a 240 grain bullet between 1400 and 1650 feet per second, giving it the ability to outstep the standard 44 Remington Magnum. While the cartridge design was a sound idea, the firearm that shot it wasn't. The original Automag was not the most desired pistol due to its size and recoil, and in an attempt to drum up demand, the company took a loss of around $1,000 on each pistol they produced, rendering the company bankrupt in only nine short months. Huh, I wonder if that's some kind of record. Without the consistently available platform to shoot it from, the cartridge became an unpopular and uncommon choice. While the performance may have been impressive and great for hunting, the difficulty in acquiring a pistol chambered for it, or chambering another pistol for it, made this an esoteric choice with a cult following. It just goes to show, 
promising performance won't save a cartridge if you can't find a platform to use it in. Number 3. The 445 Superman Okay, stop me if you've heard this before. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time! The brainchild of the late Elgin Gates, the 445 Super Mag was a cartridge that he had come up with, along with several others for use in silhouette pistol competitions. At the time this cartridge was dreamed up, people had accepted the 44 Magnum with open arms. Handgun hunting was a serious thing, and silhouette competition was very popular. So why not take the 44 Magnum and supercharge it? The 445 Super Mag was a 44 Magnum case that was lengthened from 1.285 inches to 1.610 inches, allowing for a good amount of additional powder to increase the velocity of the .429 inch bullet. The 240 grain bullets could exceed 1,650 feet per second when pushed to the limit, and 300 grain bullets could get into the 1,400 feet per second plus arena. Given the increased performance, you'd expect it to have taken off when it was released in 1988. The 454 Casul had been around since 1983, along with the 357 Maximum and Super Mags, and the 375 Super Mag had come on the scene in 1984. But like Vince McMahon's recent re-release of the XFL in 2020, if you get your new product's timing wrong, it can spell disaster. Elgin Gates had pushed the Dan Wesson company to release their Model 40 in 445 Super Mag by 1986, but it didn't hit the market until two years later. At that time, silhouette competition was waning in popularity, and handgun hunters were already swarming freedom arms for a Model 83 chambered in the powerful 454 Casul, which was the 445 Super Mag's direct competition. With less power than the 454 Casul and a larger frame to accommodate the very long cartridge, the 445 Super Mag had hit the ground and sprained its ankle. Dan Wesson was the sole producer of revolvers in the 445 Super Mag, and they continued producing them until the early 2000s. When they were bought up by CZ in 2005, they released a few more models in the 445 Super Mag. But it never regained what little popularity it had, and sadly, rode off into the sunset. Number 2. The 10mm Mag. Okay, this is one weird, bizarre cartridge idea. I mean, I like weird and bizarre cartridge ideas and have always had a curiosity about this round, but to say this was not the most solid idea is like saying the San Andreas Fault is not the most stable place to build your home. Harry Sanford, yes, the very same man mentioned from our number four entry, brought back the concept of a semi-auto short recoil operated pistol with a big bore cartridge in 1992 when his company, Arcadia Machine and Tool, released the Automag 4. The big pistol was chambered in the 45 Winchester Magnum and an all new round, the 10mm Magnum. The 10mm Magnum sported a 10mm auto brass case that was stretched from 0.992 inches to 1.242 inches. This allows the cartridge to shoot a 180 grain bullet at velocities up to 1,550 feet per second. Keep in mind that a 40 Smith & Wesson will shoot the same bullet at 1,010 feet per second, the 10mm auto will shoot it at 1,250 feet per second, and the mighty 40 Super will go to 1,450 feet per second tops. So the 10mm Magnum has some serious power. But along with being the only semi-auto pistol to ever be chambered in this cartridge, when the 10mm Magnum Automag 4 was released, there was absolutely no factory ammo being made! It was a load your own or buy something else proposition. That's like selling a new sports car and telling the buyer to distill their own gasoline for it. Dumb! And within one year the 10mm Magnum option was discontinued. The cartridge has persisted with folks who have bored out the cylinders of 10mm auto revolvers like the Smith & Wesson 610 and more recently the Ruger Super Red Hawk, and nowadays Double Tap does make factory ammo for it. When you bring out a new cartridge that is chambered for one gun and tell your customers to make their own ammunition, it shouldn't surprise you that it goes over like a lead balloon. Not to mention that there was a competitor that could outperform the 10mm Magnum in the already existing, albeit rare, 41 Magnum which had factory ammunition. Man, you've really screwed up when the 41 Magnum ends up being more readily available by far than the new cartridge you developed. A cartridge that doesn't have its own place to let it shine, comes only chambered in one gun, and requires its brand new customers to learn to reload before they can even shoot it once, is a recipe for one epic fail. Number one, drum roll please. The 450 Magnum Express. Oh boy, where do I even begin talking about how bad of an idea this was? Before Wayne Baker and Dick Casul got Freedom Arms' doors opened, the two had been associated with North American arms. Dick Casul had designed some of their micro-revolvers in 22 Long Rifle and 22 Magnum, which North American Arms still sells today. 
But when Dick and Wayne were ready to set out on their own, North American Arms wasn't ready to let go of Dick the Soul's idea of a 45 Colt Magnum cartridge that could shoot a 260 grain bullet at an impressive 1,800 feet per second. So they decided to make their own version of it. While Freedom Arms was taking Dick Casool's Wildcat and bringing it to market as what we now know as the 454 Casool, North American Arms developed their own Magnum Plus round around 1981, which hit the market in 1984, one year after the 454 Casool. The 450 Magnum Express was the new round and it could shoot a 260 grain Sierra jacketed hollow point up to 1,725 feet per second, putting it right in line with Freedom Arms' own 454 Casool. And that sounds like a recipe for success. So why did I start off by saying this was a bad idea? Well, the 454 Casool's parent case was the venerable revolver round, the 45 Colt. They lengthened it to 1.383 inches long and used small rifle primers to strengthen the case head by leaving more brass in place. But North American Arms decided that the 450 Magnum Express cartridge, a cartridge that was intended from the very beginning to be chambered in a single action revolver, would use the 45 Winchester Magnum case. They did this by lengthening it from 1.198 inches to 1.344 inches and kept the cartridge rimless like the 45 Win Mag which was designed for a semi-auto pistol. Say what? Now if you're not a revolver aficionado, allow me to explain why this makes as much sense as an inflatable dartboard. Revolvers use a rim on their brass casings for the cartridge to headspace on. In a semi-auto pistol, this is highly impractical as it creates massive issues in feeding, possible rim lock in the magazine, and may prevent proper head spacing which will hurt accuracy. The semi-rimmed 38 ACP and 38 Super suffered from this problem until Colt redesigned their pistols to head space on the case mouth. Now head spacing on the case mouth isn't a big deal in a semi-auto as the cartridges that are waiting to be fired are in a magazine, and that prevents the bullets from jumping their taper crimp and leaves the case mouth available for head spacing. But in a revolver that is shooting Magnum or Magnum Plus cartridges, you need a strong roll crimp to keep those bullets in place. Otherwise, they will start to scoot out of the brass casing, creating inconsistent velocities as you fire, or even result in the bullets sticking out of the cylinder and jamming the damn gun. You can't roll crimp a cartridge that is going to head space on the case mouth, as the case mouth will not be usable for head spacing with that type of crimp. And a taper crimp is never going to hold bullets in place when you are generating the kind of power that the 450 Magnum Express generates. The 50 Action Express generates less power than the 454 Casool, and it is known for having serious crimp jumping issues when shot from a revolver. Serious shooters recognized immediately how foolish it was to not make this a rimmed cartridge. By 1987, North American Arms' parent company was sold, and the new owners, they had no interest in continuing this slow-selling revolver. After three years, the 450 Magnum Express was unceremoniously euthanized, and the firearms community has barely spoken of it since. So, before we go, let's recap that list. Number 5, the 400 Corban, the 10mm Wannabe. Number 4, the 44 Automag Pistol, a niche gun at assembly line prices equals dead cartridge. Number 3, the 445 Super Mag, so fashionably late, the party was already over. Number 2, the 10mm Magnum, like buying a Ferrari that requires you to assemble the engine. And number 1, the 450 Magnum Express, it makes as much sense as putting monster truck tires on a Formula 1 race car. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the list. What other big bore cartridges out there do you feel totally face planted on the concrete? Let us know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more content. If you didn't like it, keep your comments to yourself. Get the f*** out of here Brie Larson. Our viewers are more than welcome to share their negative comments with us. And if you didn't enjoy it, thanks for making it this far and giving our videos a chance. And remember, go big bore or go home.